intersectionality is something that's just come up in public discourse so much uh, within the last year or two. Uh, a term that I feel like was pretty relatively unknown um, within you know the last 20 years, but all of a sudden it, it really has kind of raised public awareness as issues of, of social justice and um, oppression and race issues and, and these kinds of things have come to the forefront of, of a lot of political debate and discussion. Um, so I want to get my thoughts on on intersectionality. I've addressed some of these um, cultural issues in the past. You can check out you know videos and podcasts that I've done on um, feminism, on gender theory, on um, cultural Marxism, the Frankfurt School, and, and some of that stuff that's very much related to this because a lot of this really does tie together in terms of things that are kind of related to um, ideological progressivism. Um, so intersectionality is something that, you know, I heard a lot about. I never made comments about it. Um, it I didn't for a while. And the reason is because I, I'm not comfortable making comments about something that I haven't done my own research on. Um, I'm not the type of person that will just kind of watch um, a video from my own perspective that's critiquing something and then just kind of echo those criticisms. Um, so before I made any comments about intersectionality, it's I wanted to just read what the actual intersectional authors were saying. Um, so I did go out of my way to read a couple books, um, which were, you know, set forth as kind of introductory manuals to intersectionality from those who promoted this view. So I could really get a more balanced understanding of, of where they're coming from, what these ideas are all about. Uh, so basically, intersectionality began in 1989. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is the, the founder of intersectionality as a movement. She's the first one to use the term. Um, it, it got a lot more popular through the 1990s, particularly in more radical feminism, gender theory, uh, different areas of, of study, and only recently has it kind of come into public consciousness. Um, so, you know, what is intersectionality? What does the term mean? Uh, so basically, intersectionality differentiates itself from older feminism, and, and that would be like second wave feminism, um, which identifies itself more so in, in terms of a kind of neo-Marxism or what's sometimes called cultural Marxism. Uh, in other words, the idea that there are basically two classes, kind of the oppressor, and then there's the oppressed class. So you have kind of an us versus them thing, and it's easy to kind of categorize. These are the oppressors. These are the oppressed. Um, with, you know, second wave feminism, often it's the case that oppressor is man. Um, the oppressed is woman. And these are kind of two clashing groups of, of people. And what what happened within feminism is there there were a lot of statements and, and assertions from especially white feminists that all women have the same kinds of experiences um you know we're all women we're all oppressed and therefore we have to fight against the patriarchy um and the fact was that you know particularly black women um and, and uh, hispanic women as well started coming out and saying well um you white women really have a very different cultural experience and you have privilege in areas that we don't. So there really is no way to just divide people as these are men, these are women, women all have the same experience of, of oppression because there's a very different experience for a black woman than there is for a white woman in, for example, the United States. Um, and this doesn't just have to do with the United States either, but that's where I live. So that's what I'm thinking of. Um, so this this then sets up this idea that there is a kind of there are these intersections of of one's um, identity that one must understand in order to understand systems of oppression. In other words, we can't think just simplistically in terms of say women are oppressed and men are oppressors, um, but we have to think about all the other facets of life as well to figure out what the systems of oppression are really all about. So then this leads to some other discussions, particularly when this starts, it, it really is about um, race being added to what was kind of second into third wave feminism. Um, so now you have gender and race. Sexuality is pretty early on tied into that. And so you have a lot of um, lesbian uh, women who are writing uh, in this field of intersectionality, talking about oppression and the different experiences they have with their sexuality and other things. Um, so you have basically these kind of three main areas then, which are gender, race, um, and sexuality. Eventually, you do have ideas of class coming in, which is more classical Marxism, uh, you know, economic issues as well. 
Um, and, and today it's really expanded to all sorts of things. Now you have issues of disability and you have issues of, um, you know, how obese somebody is and, and all sorts of other things as well. And, and they're all kind of tied together. Um, so, you know, intersectionality, when I read, when I, when I've read some of their work, uh, in some ways it, it appears as if, in some ways it's more nuanced than, than the older kind of Frankfurt school of, of Marxism or, or neo-Marxism. Um, and they're critical of, of Marxism in some ways. Um, because they, they do try to have a more kind of nuanced, holistic understanding of human persons than just to be able to categorize them into simply one class or another class. And so some ways, you know, I, I appreciate that it's a little more nuanced and they're trying to kind of get at the complexities of life, which extend far beyond, you know, just gender or something like that um, or economic class. Um, and so they're right that these things certainly do intersect and they do impact one's identity and all of these various ideas and, and places in society and gender and sexuality and all that stuff. Um, it, it does impact how you function in the world, how people treat you and all this kind of stuff. So that part of it is, is true. Um, but the problem, and there are many problems, um, but part of the problem is they're really still doing the same thing. They've just added more categories, but essentially they're still they're still trying to lump people together in these little groups. The groups have just kind of changed. Um, and so the groups have changed. Now it's not just women, but it's black women or black lesbian women or black disabled lesbian women. Um, and so it, it doesn't really solve, I think, the issue. And, and I think if you're going to really be consistent and think through the issue, what you really come down to is the fact that there people just have different experiences and all people have different experiences. And, and, and certainly we can say, yeah, there are a lot of similarities in those who happen to have the same race and gender, but ultimately our experiences are our own. And it, it does seem that the kind of categories that intersectionality is working with are kind of arbitrary because there are, if you're talking about privilege and what can see ahead in society, I mean, you can just add categories kind of ad, ad infinitum. Um, there are so many factors like, um, you know, attractiveness, for example. Uh, if you are more attractive, you will get ahead in life. So do we start talking about, uh, you know, a, attractive privilege? And I guess maybe thin privilege is part of that, but, but being attractive is more than being thin. Um, being af athletic. Uh, if you're athletic, you're, you tend to be more popular. Extroverts tend to um, get ahead in some ways that introverts don't because they naturally know how to talk to people and naturally are, are better in social situations, which is going to get them more connections. Which, you know, the point is you can just expand and expand and expand and expand and expand to the point where you're the only person that fits your unique category, which is true because we're all individuals and have different personalities and have different experiences. So while intersectionality in a sense does kind of get at the complexities better than, you know, kind of neo-Marxism does in reality, like we're all just different people. We all have different experiences. We can't just subsume ourselves into these little group identities. And so that really leads, I think, to a very major problem. Uh, and the other problem that you find within, you know, intersectionality is that um, you do kind of have this reverse hierarchy where it, it does appear that there is even a kind of competition among individuals to see who is who can be the most oppressed. And you know, I say this for just kind of knowing some people that are in, involved in this or, you know, are, are uh, supportive of intersectionality and just the way that they talk on social media and other places is that they, they speak about, they, they try to like have as many places of oppression as they possibly can to the point where th they're almost seeing it. It seems, it feels like one of uh, Derrida's kind of binary oppositions, right? You have what where you have <laughs> these two different opposites, which are um, the oppressor and then the oppressed. And it's almost like what they're trying to do is just flip those roles so that the most oppressed now get the power and the oppressors are the ones that need to be shut down or silenced. Um, that's definitely the impression I get from from looking at people who are involved in this. The, the other thing that's just kind of amusing, I guess, um, it, just in reading the intersectionality theorists is 
they're really embarrassed that their ideas come largely from a white man. <laughs> um, so Michel Foucault is who I'm thinking about, um, but other postmodern thinkers as well who are largely white men. Um, so there is a kind of, the, you can find even kind of like apologies um, for the fact that they're citing white men or ways to kind of explain their way around it, like they have to justify themselves. And I think that just goes to show the main problem, which is they're just judging people based on class and category and, and all of these other things. And they're not just like looking at ideas and you start just making all of these judgments on people based on all these other things, which is like what they're trying to fight against because they're fighting against those the fact that we categorize and oppress people based on race, sex, class, and all of those things. But they end up doing exactly the same thing because what they're doing is judging all sorts of other people by exactly that. So me as a white man, I, I would be kind of shot down in any of these conversations because I am privileged and, and it's true. You know, I'm not going to like deny that I'm, that I'm privileged. I, I grew up in an upper middle-class family. I went to a private uh, high school, a private college. Um, I'm white. It's true. You know, I, I'm not going to deny that. Um, but does that mean because I have certain areas of privilege that my ideas are all wrong? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd hope you'd kind of take the ideas in themselves and say, do they have any merit? If they do, then listen to them. If they don't, then who cares about me and what my background is? Take the ideas for what they are. Um, and I think that's how we should, we should treat and, and look at people uh, in that way. So anyway, um, that's, those are my thoughts on intersectionality. Um, I could talk a lot more about it. And if you want me to, I could probably do a whole podcast like dealing with it more in depth and looking at actual texts and things like that. But this is just a kind of brief summary, intersectionality, these are my thoughts.